Welcome to my first video, you may even call it a tutorial, about Glitch Machine's palindrome. There are some great tutorials at um, Glitch Machine's website, you'll find the link to them in the description below, and I'm not going to repeat the things you'll find in these tutorials. But there are some aspects of the synth which are not mentioned there, and there are some others which are mentioned but might be misunderstood. And there are some aspects which deserve to be looked at more in detail. It's these things I'm going to show and explain here in this video. I've produced a lot of tutorials about granular synthesis, mainly on the channel you are watching right now. For example, the series about Crusher X. But palindrome is different. Yes, I'd like to say it's some of a kind. It's one of a kind. Whereas Crusher X offers a bunch of functions for the meticulous uh, sound composer, palindrome rather addresses your ludic drive, but it offers some very useful ways to design sound in a methodical way as well. All right, first matter, the grid. Reading the manual and looking at Palindrome's GUI, you may think that each quarter of the grid represents one of the four samplers and drawing the path to the, uh, of the playhead into another quarter will make the sampler in the first quarter silent. But that's a misconception. Each and every of the four samplers is addressed everywhere across the whole grid. It's not the quarters, but the four corners of the grid, which belong to a certain sampler. Moving away from this corner makes the sampler letting, uh, letting out its uh, sound less and less loud, and makes one or more of the other three samplers, which are sitting in the other three corners of the grid, letting out their sound louder and louder. But each sampler is prepared to, let's say, broadcast its sound all over the grid, metaphorically speaking. Well, it's morphing the sounds quite smoothly, by the way, from one or more of the samplers into the sound of one or more of the other samplers. We can say that the grid represents four coordinate systems at the same time, one for each of the samplers. Sampler 1 sits in the upper left corner and its coordinate system looks like that. Sampler 2 sits in the upper right corner and its coordinate system looks like this. Sampler 3 sits in the lower left corner and its coordinate system looks like in this graph. And sampler 4 sits in the lower right corner, and its coordinate system is this one. If only one sampler, if only sampler 1, for example, contains a sample, moving the breakpoint from left to right makes the sound quieter and quieter until it fades away in the end. It's the same when I move the breakpoint downwards. When one or more of the other samplers contain a sample too, then their sound gets louder and louder to the same amount to which the sound of sampler 1 gets quieter and quieter according to the drawn path or the moving of the breakpoint. Well, one example. I start in the upper left corner and get sound only from sampler 1. 
Now I move the break point into the middle of the upper left uh, quarter of the grid. I still get a dominant sampler one, but also all of the other samplers start delivering sound, as we hear and as we see in the four coordinate systems. Let's travel ahead. Next stop in the, uh, in the very middle of the grid. Now all four samplers deliver sound equally loud. Well, equally loud only if all loaded samples are equally loud itself or themselves or made equally loud using the amp adjustments of each sampler. Moving the rake point further down to the, uh, to the middle of the lower left corner makes the sound from sample, one, uh, sample 4 dominant but the other three sounds still contribute an audible part. And at last in the lower right corner, it's nearly 100% sampler 4. Well, it is 100% sampler 4, which reaches the output. But why do I talk about these things in such details? Well, when it comes to drawing more complex paths, and to modulations of the rate parameter, it's crucial to have a good notion where in the grid does which oscillator contribute to the sound and to what an amount each oscillator contributes to the sound at this certain point. Just fooling around with palindrome is absolutely okay. It's fun and you will get in, in really interesting and great results, by chance, of course. And that's okay. There's a great random functionality anyway, isn't it? So, be cool about that. I, at least, am cool about that. But it's also possible to have a more, let me call it, compositional approach and to handle palindrome more methodically, and that's okay as well. And only this approach, the compositional one, needs tutorials like the one you are watching right now, doesn't it? And anyway, I like knowing my gear, really. And because, <clears throat> sorry, and because there are a couple of parameters to keep in mind, the size of the grains and their positions in the sample, the aforesaid path of the playhead, the speed of the playhead, the pitch and panorama of the grains, and because all of these parameters can be modulated, and these modulations can proceed at different speeds as well, it is important that the influence of each of these parameters become second nature to you if you want your composing of the sound to proceed more or less fluently. Well, end of preaching now. I will draw a line along the path I walked along with my breakpoint. We see and hear that samplers 2 and 3 never get dominant while the breakpoint walks along the drawn path. Uh, just by the way, please notice that the rate, meaning how fast the playhead moves along the drawn path, can be adjusted to zero, meaning the playhead remains at its starting position or at the position where it is when the rate parameter gets zero. Please keep that in mind when you modulate this parameter. Next matter. You may, for some reason, want a sampler to play the sound file in original speed and shape sometimes. To achieve that, you need to know the exact length of the sound file which you have loaded into the sampler. I've chosen this little melody and loaded it in sampler 1. The melody is exactly 9 seconds long, 9 seconds, what is 9000 milliseconds. I have to modulate the position of the playhead in a way that makes it move through the sound file in 9000 milliseconds. I open the envelope editor, draw a straight upwards line from 0, which represents the very beginning of the sound file, up to 100%, 
which represents the very end of the sound file. The whole modulation shall take 9000 milliseconds. We are lucky because palindrome lets us dial in the duration in milliseconds. I adjust 9000 milliseconds. Uh, by the way, if I need to adjust a value in smaller steps, I press and hold the control key and move my mouse until I get the value I need. Kind of fine tuning of a value, of a parameter, of course. Well then, let me control the results. And indeed, with a bit of adjusting of the length of the grains, the melody gets not only recognizable, but even quite similar to the original. Changing the duration of the envelope of the envelope makes the melody play faster or slowlier, but the pitch keeps the same. Let me say something about the grains, the grains themselves in palindrome. The maximum size of a grain is one whole second, which is 1000 milliseconds. We can make the playhead move across the grains forward, what is the default adjustment, or in reverse. And there are three different grain windows available. Please imagine the grain window as a volume envelope which is applied to each grain. If the grain window is rectangle, is a rectangle, every grain starts uh, abruptly at 100% of its volume, keeps that level and ends as abruptly as it began. This window type leads to a lot of artifacts and to rather harsh and edgy sounds. The triangle window and the hen window both smooth the beginning and the end of the grain out. The difference between these two window types is often quite small. Okay, but what about the samplers themselves? Is there any maximal file length we can load? Well, practically not. I think it depends on the RAM memory your computer is equipped with. 
I'm not so sure about that, but I'm, I think so. Um, I've loaded, for example, a sample of more than 64 minutes, more than an hour, and palindrome worked with it perfectly. Not that there would be a lot of sense working with samples that huge, anyway. Let me show you use, a useful little feature, which I haven't found mentioned anywhere else. If uh, you double-click on a parameter, or if you use the combination ALT, alternate, plus mouse click, the, uh, the parameter jumped, uh, jumps back to its default value. You can use uh, the left or the right mouse button. All right. I also have to talk about the file management in this video, perhaps, it depends on how long this video is going to be, <laughs> otherwise it will be in the second video. But I want to demonstrate a more complex example concerning modulations at first. It may be less interesting for those of you who prefer a more playful approach, but it will be very useful for those of you who like a more planful, a more compositional approach to designing sound. Our melody is still in sample. One. But I floated a recording I made in a shopping center into sampler 2. I reduced the size of the grains a bit in both samplers and want palindrome to play a certain part of the sample in sampler 1, the melody, and another certain part in sampler 2, the recording from the shopping center. The part in sampler 1 shall be played twice. Then palindrome shall jump to sampler 2 and play the chosen part there, but only once. Both parts shall be played at the same speed as the original sample. I want original speed, as I said. Therefore, the length of the modulation by the two envelopes, which modulate the start parameter, has to be 9000 milliseconds with sample 1, and the length of the new sample in sampler 2, which is 14790 milliseconds. I draw a path from sampler 1 to sampler 2. But no matter which way I choose, palindrome morphs from one sample to the other instead of jumping. And, of course, the playback starts at the position according to the start knob of each sampler and ends at the end of the sample. I have to draw the left point, the starting point of the envelope, which modulates the start parameter of sampler 1. I have to draw this point higher until the playback starts at the beginning of the chosen part in sampler 1. The right end point must be drawn lower until the playback ends at the end of the, cho at the, end of the chosen part in sampler 1. But, oh no, the playback speed is a lot lower now. Well, of course, the length of the envelope is still at 9 seconds, whereas the chosen part is a lot smaller. I have to adjust the length of the envelope to the length of the chosen part, therefore.
OK. The same procedure with sampler 2 now. Now I'll have to solve the problem with morphing instead of jumping. Well then, what do I want? I want the playhead stay to stay at sampler 1 at first. How long? Well, two times the length of the chosen part of sampler 1, which we found is 1899 milliseconds long. The time of staying with sampler 1 is 2 times 1899 milliseconds, what is 3798 milliseconds. Please remember, I said I want palindrome to play the chosen part of sampler 1 two times. I want the playhead to stay with sampler 1 for 3798 milliseconds, therefore. Then the playhead shall hurry along the drawn path as fast as possible, in no time, to make clear what I want. And with sampler 2, the playhead shall stay one length of the chosen part, which is 1171 milliseconds, as I have measured. Well, I construct a third envelope, which will modulate the rate parameter of the path to achieve that. The whole envelope length has to be adjusted to our 3798 milliseconds, the length of envelope 1, plus 1171 milliseconds, the length of envelope 2. All in all, it's 4969 nice milliseconds. The first two points of the envelope has to be both at zero level. Rate equals zero, no movement along the drawn path at all. The third point in the envelope has to be at maximum level, the fastest possible movement, the jump to sampler 2. The next point has to be at zero level again, because the playhead shall stay with sampler 1 until the end of the chosen part and the end of the envelope. There's a bit of a problem. It's not that easy to draw two points very near to each other. It would be wonderful if we could type the position of a, uh, of a point with numbers. Perhaps in a later version it will be.
Well, quite good so far. I have to adjust the jump points to 3798 milliseconds now, an undertaking which um, needs a bit of trying, because the grid is helpful but doesn't allow an exact measurement on the level of milliseconds. But in the end, we get something like that. If I want the whole thing as a one-shot procedure, I'm ready now. I just have to release the key or to otherwise close the gate after the one-shot. But if I want the whole thing to repeat more or less endlessly, then I must simply draw one more point. I must make the rate jump to maximum one more time. Please take care that the adjusted lengths of the three envelopes are absolutely exact at the point, exact at the point, because the jumps would otherwise consecutively wander along the playhead's path. I would not have mentioned terms like planful and compositional approach if I weren't going to provide you with a general scheme of what we have done in the last example. And here it is. It may look a bit complicated, but it describes exactly what we've been doing for the last few minutes. And it bears a huge advantage. With this scheme in mind, or on paper, you'll be able to program every transition you'd like palindrome to make. If you spend some minutes understanding this scheme, it will be easy to adapt it to any compositional idea concerning any path of the playhead and morphing the four samples. Thank you for watching. There may well be more videos about palindrome in the next future. Just describe to stay tuned. There are tons of my tutorials and other kinds of videos at www.rofil-media.net and you are most welcome to visit me there. Enjoy your day, your Czech tutor, Rolf.